All right, folks, this morning we're talking about why we sing, and we're going to use the hymn in our hymnal, When the Lord Appears in Glory, to teach that. When the Lord Appears in Glory is a rewritten hymn that we put in our hymnal from the song you may be more familiar with, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. And uh, I didn't know what kind of role they're talking about. And the only place the Book of Life and, and the, the roles in the Bible are mentioned are typically in Israel's program in those books. And so I, I much more liked Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, when Paul tells us to look for the Lord's appearing in glory. And so uh, we re rewrote the song to sing about when the Lord appears in glory. Uh, you'll be there. We'll be there because we believe the gospel, the grace of God. But primarily the, 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 the topic this morning is why we sing in the church. Colossians 3.16 is on your grace hymnals on the front, and it's also on the top of your outline, where Paul instructs us to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so there is an instruction, there is a Pauline commandment here to sing in the church together, okay? You say, well, why would we do that? Uh, if we're just coming together to study the Bible. Well, there's a function to it. And Paul says it's to teach and admonish. It's to sing with grace in your hearts. In Ephesians 5, he says it's to make melody. That is to sing with one voice, one note, uh, to sing together. And that's one thing that we can do when we come together in, in like-mindedness, to sing songs with one understanding, because we're all singing the same words. And wouldn't that be a great thing to have unity in the church? And so that's a reason why we sing. But this morning, we're going to cover four different reasons why Paul says in Colossians 3 that we should sing in the church, okay? Now, of course, Christianity at large typically has a lot longer periods of their gatherings and in their church services for worship, which is what they call their musical time. I don't say singing because in some churches, people don't sing. It's the band on the stage that does the singing, uh, so they play the music. But what's happened is that music has been used now in the church as a form of attraction, as a means of entertainment. People like music, they like singing, they like songs. People write songs naturally. They sing songs naturally. You listen to the radio, you've got your favorite uh, uh, you know, stations, uh, uh, websites that you listen to. So you, <clears throat> you like music. And so to attract people to their church, Christians put on a big display of music. And that's supposed to be an attraction. That is one of the reasons why we don't sing. Okay? It's not an attraction for people. Uh, especially if you've heard me sing. <laughs> it's not an attraction for people. Okay, that's not why we sing. If that were the case, then we should really do a, you know, an American Idol church version, uh, which is really all American Idol is, people from church worship ministries, and, and, and find out who the best singer is, and then have them up here leading the singing, and then find out the best musicians and have them up here so that we can all listen to the greatness of their musical ability. Okay, because as they're ministering to the Lord, we now have music ministers and music pastors. So that their ministry to God is by music. And so praise the Lord, these people are so good. And so you have Christian music that's supposed to be what Christians listen to, which is only half as good as real music. But it's available so that Christians can say, look, we do it too. And so you've got Christian rap, Christian rock, Christian whatever style you want, Christianized. Um, again, that's not the function of music in the church. Okay. You may have favorite songs. I have favorite songs that were written not by Christians. That are not Christian at all. Okay, the lyrics are not Christian even. But that's the nature of music. It sounds good. I like to hear it. It's a good tune. Some of the original hymns in the, uh, the hymns of a century ago were written to the tune of popular songs of the, of the time. But because they realized the function of music and singing in the church, they changed the words so that they can sing them in the assembly of believers. That's because they understood the function of music was not to entertain, it was not to attract and appeal, but it was to teach and admonish. Teach meaning teaching doctrine. You say, well, I thought the pastor did that after the, the worship band got down. Well, he does that too, but you much more remember the song you sang than sometimes what the pastor says. Okay, and that's the, the, one of the functions of music. The other function is to admonish. As we've been doing the last six or seven weeks, talking about the doctrine in the words, in the songs that we sing, has anyone felt admonished? Felt a little challenged to grow? Felt a little bit more that, hey, I need to love the Lord more as we sing more love to thee. And you know what? I need to learn what it means to be content as we sing it as well. And so as we study those lyrics, we should be admonished. And this is the purpose of singing. You say, well, those aren't my favorite songs. That's not the point. 
These may not be your favorite chairs either. This may not be the favorite decorations you have in these walls. But you know what? There's a function that a church is supposed to perform in a place for singing in that church, in that assembly. And Paul says to teach and admonish. If your singing, if your music in the church is not doing that, it is failing to do what God would have us do, singing in the church. Okay? By the way, the church isn't the only place that you can sing. And so you have your own songs, sing them somewhere else. Sing it on your own, uh, your, in your own uh, time. But here when we meet together, we have a specific function, and that's to do the Lord's will. And so we sing to teach and admonish. <clears throat> Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> but why do we sing? Why singing? You know, why not play video games to teach and admonish? Why singing? Singing, of course, is a natural expression of the emotions that we feel. And when you sing right doctrine, it can have a mental uh, aspect as well. Colossians 3, verse 1, this is the chapter that Paul deals with the singing down in verse 16. But he says in verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now we'll deal with the things that are above here in a moment. But Paul says, if ye then be risen with Christ, stop and consider the statement there for a moment in 2014. Because we can say that just as true today as it was 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote it. If you be risen with Christ, Jesus Christ, the historical figure disputed and debated by so many people, is risen today. Praise God for that. But not just that Jesus Christ is risen, but resurrection is real. This is something that society has still yet to discover, yet to appreciate, yet to believe in the resurrection. The number one reason why Christians sing and have historically sung is because we have something to sing about. Okay? There is good news. Whereas the world is depressed by death, we have an answer to it. Where the world is defeated by the troubles in this world, we have resurrection in Christ. And we can be raised in him. We sing because we have something to sing about. If things like the resurrection and Jesus Christ giving you all spiritual blessings does not light your fire, then you need to spend more time in God's word and prayer. Because apparently you don't have much to sing about. But you see, Christians sing when they learn right doctrine because they realize the importance of it in their life and for eternity. And it gives them something to sing about. Christ is risen from the dead. And that is one source of our joy which we'll deal with a little bit later. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, to rejoice evermore. One of the instructions, as Paul says, to pray without ceasing, as he says, in everything give thanks, is to rejoice evermore. Well, how else do you rejoice if not by singing, okay? If not by the expression of that joy. That's how you rejoice. That's one way to do it. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice is the song that people sing. Right? Rejoice in the Lord always. People make a song out of that verse. You rejoice by singing. And this is part of why we sing, is to have that joy expressed, to remind ourselves of the right doctrine and produce that in us. We rejoice because resurrection is real. Okay? It's not some pious platitude. It's not just a belief that I have my opinion, you have your opinion. Resurrection is real. And praise God for that. It's a reality that you can have freely by trusting what Christ did on the cross for you. Without the resurrection, specifically the resurrection of Christ, many of our songs would be meaningless. Go back and look at your outlines the last six or seven weeks, or the songs in your hymnal, and ask yourself, if Christ did not resurrect, would we have anything to sing about in these songs? And the answer, most of the time, would be no. There's nothing there to sing about. When we, ana when we analyzed the song by Calvary, that Calvary would not be a means of singing, a, a thing to sing about, if Christ just died. It's that he resurrected, that it's a good thing and that we can sing about it as good news. We talked about to God be the glory. And we studied about how David sang psalms glorifying God, but the to God be the glory song that we sing as the church had words expressing God's glory in his offering salvation to all men. Well, that salvation would never have been offered to you if Christ did not resurrect from the dead, if resurrection was not real, you see. And so we sang about that, the mystery that we sung about last week, to make men see the fellowship of the mystery. That mystery hinges upon the resurrection of Christ. Paul says without Christ's resurrection, your faith is in vain. It's just empty. It's meaningless. It's useless. So there's no reason to sing, you see. As people start to refuse sound doctrine and deny the resurrection, and particularly the resurrection in their own life, 
then you know what happens? They stop singing doctrinal songs and start singing songs about what they can see and touch and feel. Feel like the love of the Lord. And so they start singing, I will sing of your love forever. And you touch me is what they sing. And feel me. And a lot of the songs on the, the latest contemporary Christian list on, on the radio are now sung about miracles, things that they want to see God working in the world. Because they have failed to understand what God has done, what God is doing today through the mystery of Christ. Christians sing because we have something to sing about. The reason why Christians continue to sing, even though their doctrinal understanding is vapid, is because they are singing about the God of the Bible. Okay? There's a lot of religions that teach not to sing, believe it or not. Okay, but we do sing. Christians have a hope. We have a resurrection. We have eternal life given to us. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, Paul says, If in this life only we have hope, then we're of all men most miserable. You know that verse? Paul's talking to the Corinthians about resurrection, and he says if resurrection isn't real, if Christ didn't resurrect, and if you can't resurrect from the dead because of him, then you know what? What I'm telling you to do is just miserable. What I'm telling you to do, that the most important thing you can provide to God in your life is to be a part of the church, and the, the thing that I'm telling you to do, which is to spend time studying God's word and meeting together as the church, equipping each other, that's just a waste of your time. And it just makes you miserable. And if resurrection isn't real, if there isn't that joy that you can have from eternity, then you know what? The biggest joy you can have is just what you eat, what you drink, the simple pleasures of life. You know, go home. Why are you here listening to me for? You see, Paul says we're all men most miserable, especially since Paul was being persecuted for what he believed. Why would you take such suffering if resurrection wasn't real, if you did not have a real hope of glory? Okay? And so without resurrection, we don't have something to sing about. I mentioned most religions do not teach and advocate singing. So that's not true. A lot of people sing in the world. That's true. A lot of people sing in the world. But read the religious documents. Read the Buddhist eight principles. Read the Quran and the Hadith and those that teach Islam. The most devout in Muslims, the most devout Buddhists do not sing. The scriptures do not teach it. And they say if you're devout, you won't do it. You won't dance. You won't sing. You won't have that expression of emotion. Right? The Bible is unique in not only telling you as the church to sing, but it gives you examples of it. There's a whole book called the Psalms, which were songs, of course. You would not sing that doctrine, it being for the kingdom and for Israel. But there's a whole book of the Bible about David singing, right? And that David danced, oh no. But this is what something God put in the Bible and says, look, this is what happens. And it's an expression of people's joy for the Lord. Paul tells the church then for this dispensation to sing with one another. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing is the commandment. Right? Do it. And it shouldn't be something that's forced. It should be something as a natural outgrowth of the doctrine in us. Isn't that amazing? And, and something to thank God for that he has not prohibited what in our flesh, in our human nature we see so natural that we want to sing praises. We want to sing to God's glory. And God says, well do it. <laughs> Sing to God's glory. Sing with grace in your hearts. It's not the law that we're singing about. It's grace. And so the resurrection, the Bible, Christianity is unique in this to have something to sing about. As Bill Gaither wrote his song, it's because he lives, right, is his song. And we've taken some of Bill Gaither's songs and altered the words a bit to align with right doctrine. But people write songs because they have something to sing about and praise God that he's given us his word and the mystery revealed so that we do have something more excellent to sing about. They're singing in heaven. You read the book of Revelation, and uh, it has sometimes quotes from beings in heaven. And so John is there, and he says, there's this being over there, and he, he quotes what they say. Only it doesn't say he spoke it. It says he sings it. Sometimes you skip over that, and it says, and he's saying, and it has the quote. You know, who is worthy to open the, the, the seals of this scroll, or whatever he says there. That's sung. Apparently, there's a song <laughs> that they're singing that tells what's going on. So you have to pay attention to the words in Revelation to these songs. There's the Song of Moses, where Moses has a whole chapter back there in Deuteronomy, which is a song. Now, you read it, and there's no music coming out of your Bible. And you say, well, that's pretty, that's pretty heavy, right? There's a lot of verses there. It's a song that Israel would sing when they get into their kingdom in the book of Revelation. Jesus, in Matthew 26, verse 30, after they ate that meal together, remember, and Judas said, you know, I've got to go, and Jesus said, well, go do what you've got to do. After Judas left, they sang a song. And then they left. Jesus sang. Imagine Jesus singing. I think he was a bass. 
Jesus sang. Okay? Colossians 3.16, Paul teaches us to sing. Okay, there's a reason for that. It's a natural expression of our joy. And our emotions are not evil. They should be guarded and they should be directed based upon sound doctrine. Okay? That's, that's how we deal with it. So when it comes to our singing, it, it needs to be able to teach. Singing the same thing over and over again. I mentioned before, who, who, who originally wrote that song? Was it Sonic Flood or somebody? I will sing of your love forever. Right? And then they sing the same thing forever and ever and ever. And it's the same thing over and over and over again. What exactly does that teach anybody? Right? But this should be the criteria of the, the singing in our churches. We sing because of resurrection. We sing because of Jesus Christ and his glory that he's provided for us. Number two is we sing because of his return. Look at Colossians chapter 3 where he says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. You know, Jesus Christ is not here with you. The Spirit of God dwells in you, but Jesus Christ is a man. He's God in the flesh, and he's seated in heavenly places. You know, he's absent from this earth. He is not sitting on the throne of authority behind Barack Obama in the White House. He is not sitting, ruling on this earth. He is in heavenly places. He has not yet come back, you see. And so one of the reasons why we sing is because we know what it will be like when he comes back, and his return will be glorious. If what we live in now is the kingdom, no wonder people don't sing songs about that anymore. It's horrible some sometimes out there. And yet we who know and have a hope of what it will be like when Christ returns, and it will be glorious, that's something to sing about. And many of the hymns and the good hymns that we sing, like the one we're going to sing a little bit later, is about when the Lord appears in glory and, and how that will be. The song talks about the morning being bright and fair when time is no more and we enter eternity. You ever think about the first day into eternity? Say, I don't have time for that. <laughs> you will eventually. You wake up in eternity, and that first morning, the brightness and the glory of that day, there's no more sin, no more death, no more pain, no more tears, no more corruption, no more charities to give to. There's no more problems. That's impossible. It's going to happen. That's glorious. And it's all going to happen because of what Jesus Christ accomplishes in the church and with Israel and the earth. That's glorious, folks. That's something to sing about. But the world does not know this or rejects it or doesn't believe it. We have something to sing about. Colossians 3, verse 4, it says, uh, uh, verse 2, it says, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. It's not just Jesus Christ. He's going to be brighter than the sun, as Paul says he was when he saw him. It's going to be you with him, you see. And so all of your suffering, all your sorrows, all of your lack will be gone as well. Paul says, we wait for the redemption of our bodies. Those of you with bodies who are aging and aching and growing old and breaking, that should be good news. <laughs> Something to sing about there. Okay? And so we're waiting for the Lord's return. And that's what we've been doing as the church for 2,000 years. You know, Eve waited 4,000 years for that promised seed. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, God told Eve after she sinned, after Adam sinned, that, that your seed, the seed of the woman, will bruise the head of the devil, right? He said that in Genesis 3.15. And then what happened? When did that seed come? 4,000 years later? That's a long wait. But they had the hope, didn't they? They had the promise from God. What about Abraham? We've been studying Abram and the promises given to him. And God told Abram that he'd be a mighty nation, right? And that he'd have this land. And Abram waited his whole life, more than 100 years. He never got it in his own lifetime. We even saw where God told him he was going to get it in his lifetime. But he'd live long years and, you know, peace and that sort of thing. But Abraham had to wait 2,000 years to see Jesus Christ born, see Jesus Christ minister on the earth, to see the Messiah come. David, who was given a promise of God that your child, your seed, will sit on my throne forever, had to wait another 2,000 years. Jesus didn't come to the thousand years after David. But you see, God gives promises and promises, and God keeps them. That's the point of history. That's the lesson you learn from history, is that God keeps his promises. Right? And so, he came to Israel in John 1, verse 10. He came to his own to fulfill the promises made with Eve and with Abraham and with David about the coming Messiah. He came, he died, he resurrected, and he said, and Paul says, that he's coming again. He's going to return. Now, it's been 2,000 years, and the world scoffs and says, you say he's coming again? <laughs> it's been 2,000 years. To which I say, Eve waited 4,000 years. 
So he's still got some time, apparently, if he's going to wait as long as he did with Eve. God is faithful, is the point. He will return, and when he, imagine Jesus Christ returning. All of the questions people have about him, is he real? <laughs> Answered immediately, right? What did he teach? Answered when he returns. Why is there pain and suffering in the world? Answered. When Jesus, ask him to his face, you're going to see him. Either when he returns to this planet or when you die, you'll face him face to face and be accountable for all that you've done. So you see, he is real and his return is going to be glorious for those of us who believe the gospel. He's offered us salvation freely. This is something to sing about. This is a reason why we sing. Jesus said he's going to come back. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Going back here to a time before the mystery was revealed, when Jesus died, his apostles didn't know why. So when he resurrected, he appeared to them, ate some honey and bread, some honeycomb, and um, explained to them why he had to die. And then he flies up to heaven, pulls a Superman on him, and they're sitting up there staring at the sky going, what happened? And the angel appears after they, in verse 10, it says, While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also, they're Mormons, which also, that was a joke, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So they're staring at the sky, and he's going, you need to stop staring at the sky. He's going to come back, just not in the next five minutes. Okay, he's going to return. And he says the same way in which they saw him go. Okay? The cathedral sing a song, We shall see Jesus, just as they saw him. Right? Is, this, is the verse in that song. And we're talking about here, the angel said, just as you saw him go, you'll see him return. Here's the, the glorious, more excellent good news that Paul gives us, is that we shall see Jesus not as they saw him. We shall see Jesus in his glory, when the Lord appears in glory. You know, Jesus was walking amongst them resurrected, and they were shaking his hand, eating fish with him, and he ascended up to heaven. He'll come back that way again. But when he appeared to Paul eight chapters later, it wasn't like that. When he appeared to Paul, Paul describes in Acts 9, it was brighter than the sun. He was blinded because of the light that he saw, which was the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. And that's different than Acts 1. Acts 1, they saw him. There he is. He's taking a left, taking a right. But in Acts 9, Paul's blinded. And this is how we know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Romans chapter 8 says that the sufferings that you currently have are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. You're going to be a part of his returning glory. You're going to be a part of the brightness as the sun because you're a part of the body of Christ. So the apostles looked for the return. The twelve apostles looked for his return according to their kingdom to build and establish their kingdom on the earth. And Paul looks for his return in order to receive the church up into glory. And by the way, as we're talking about singing and talking about the song we're going to sing, you need to realize that there's a difference between his coming to Israel to establish the kingdom on the earth and his coming for the church to receive them up into glory. There is a difference. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says that we're to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The glorious appearing. That glorious appearing is when he appears to receive the church up into glory. Okay? There's another appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. People call it the second coming, but if you calculate the number of times Jesus has appeared to people, since Acts chapter 1, it's more than two. Acts 1, Jesus went to heaven. Acts 9, Jesus appeared to Paul. Acts 26, he appeared to Paul again. Paul says he was seen to 500 people. Paul says he's going to come back to receive the church to glory. And then later, he's going to return to the earth for Israel's second coming to establish the kingdom on earth. But look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. You know what? Turn to Hebrews first. We'll, we'll, we'll go here. Hebrews chapter 13. Paul says we need to look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. When our affection is set on something like that, we have something to sing about. Okay? Hebrews chapter 13, down in verse 14. The Hebrews were looking for a kingdom. Jesus taught them to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Right? They're looking for a city. A promised Jerusalem that would be renewed. And he, so in the end of the book of Hebrews, it's no surprise then we read the verse that it, it says, For here have we no continuing city, here on earth, but we seek one to come. 
the audience of Hebrews, the Hebrews, were looking for a city to come to earth. You read about that city in the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22, and the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven onto the earth. The Lord comes back to establish the kingdom to bring that city to Israel. Okay? Hebrews looked for a city on the earth. We're looking to be raised up in the air. If you turn to the left, a few pages in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 15. Paul says, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. First Thessalonians 4, Paul says, this we say by the word of the Lord. Maybe we should sing about this. And there are about three or four songs in our hymnal that talk about us being raised up together with the Lord in the air. Because that's the day which you can set your bills behind. Which you could say, hey, mortgage, no more. I'm resurrected, and I'm going to heavenly glory with the Lord. First Thessalonians 4, verse 15, it says, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That is, those who are dead, we're not keeping them from seeing the Lord. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So people who die, they're not just dead. They see the Lord before you do, you see. So you who are alive and remain do not prevent those that are already dead. In verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, Paul's talking here about the coming of the Lord for the church that remains alive and well on the earth. Because he's left us here to do a ministry, right? He saved us by his grace. He's given us a position in heavenly places and left us here to do his work on this earth to preach the gospel of the grace of God, to make known the fellowship of the mystery. We are his ambassadors from heaven. Okay, that's the position you've been given. Born of earth, working for heaven. And so Paul says, these are the words of the Lord, and we're going to be caught up together when he comes. Those that are dead, by the way, are already going to see him. Okay, so don't, don't worry about that. People who are dead in Christ, they're already with the Lord in glory. And if you're alive when the Lord comes back, that's when you get caught up to glory. That's when you get promoted to glory. The Hebrews are looking for a city on the earth. Paul teaches us to look for the Lord's return so we get promoted to glory. We go up to the air. We'll look at Revelation 19, verse 11 then. We're talking about the difference between the Lord's return for Israel and for the church. I have it on my lesson plan uh, uh, in the future sometime, probably early next year, to talk about these end-time events, the Antichrist, the rapture, millennium, and that sort of thing. People have been asking me about those things. We'll be studying those in detail about when they occur and why they're different and the different positions on that. But here we're just getting a glimpse of it. And the reason why is we're talking about singing of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So many of the hymns that people have written in the past who do not rightly divide prophecy from mystery sing about Israel's coming kingdom. Sing about the Lord conquering their enemies and establishing a kingdom on the earth. Okay? That is a means of glory in a way that Israel would sing to God. I would submit to you, that's not your hope. That's not the hope of your glory. And so if you're singing Beulah Land, if you're singing God building his kingdom and, you know, the, the, the grapes of, of wrath are stored and the vintage is, 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 is you know, stomped out and that sort of thing, that's not your hope. But there is a people, there is Israel, there is the little flock who are hoping for Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the conqueror, to come back and conquer their enemies, Daniel 2.44, and establish his kingdom on the earth. And Revelation 19, verse 11, describes his coming for that purpose. Notice here, John, the revelator, he says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. That should be his name, because by this point, people have been waiting a long time. And so he's faithful and true to return. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. Notice here the purpose of his coming here. Heaven's open. The scroll is rolled back. The, the, the clouds are rolled back like a scroll, as, as, as some songwriters have written. And Jesus appears and comes to the earth to judge and make war. Okay, this is a bad day for the earth. Because this is when the high places are made low, the low places are, are, are brought up, and it's where all of the kingdoms of this world are conquered by God. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 
and he has armies in verse 14. Okay? God has given the message to the church to preach grace and peace, to preach the coming of the Lord, to receive us up to glory, a place where we'll get rewarded for the Lord for our ministry, a time when finally there will be peace, okay, that we'll, in, 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 we'll exist in, in heavenly places. In Revelation 19, Jesus Christ is coming back here with a sword, with an army, with a horse to conquer people, okay? That's not good news for the earth. If we're in here singing about Jesus Christ killing our enemies, we got it wrong, you see. He will, but now we're supposed to be singing and preaching and praising God for the grace and mercy he provides to the world. I got an article, I'll, I'll probably deal with it next week, where someone was talking about the blood moons and what God's doing with the signs and prophecy and things like that. And they're talking about what we should pray for and how we need to pray for Israel. And one of the prayers, <coughs> I chuckle, but it's really kind of a sad commentary. One of the prayers that he says that we need to pray as the church for Israel is that their enemies be dead. That all their enemies be killed. And that Israel would never die. Right? So, so, so merciful, isn't it? So gracious, isn't it? That all their enemies be slaughtered. Right? That's not the message of grace. That is not the ministry of the church. And yet that's the perspective of people who pray prayers and sing songs and think we're living in the kingdom. They have justification for their swords, to put Bible verses at the end of guns, thinking they're doing God's will and bringing in the kingdom. Okay? That's because their mentality is looking for and trying to bring in the coming of the Lord in Revelation 19, verse 11, the judgment in making war. We're looking for the Lord's return, according to the mystery, according to grace. Where, the, where God will finally take the church up to glory and we'll live with him in glory forever. And that's why we sing. Okay? In prophecy, Jesus comes to judge and make war. Isaiah chapter 9 says that he'll, his government will be no end. He'll be the prince, the, the prince of peace, the king of kings. Okay? We sing, not joy to the world, the king has come and the kingdom is here. We sing joy to the world through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation freely to all. That's how we sing joy to the world. By the way, if you can write words faster than I can, write some songs, uh, lyrics of joy to the world. We'll put it in the hymnal. It's a great tune. It's got kingdom doctrine. So we sing because of his return, according to the mystery, because it's going to be glorious. Glorious to see all those sinners saved by grace who are still alive, hopefully, at that time that get caught up in the air with him. And when we get up to heaven, you know who we're going to see when we're up to heaven in, with, glory, with glory in the Lord? We're going to see all the other people that were saved in Christ. What a good day that's going to be. Okay, finally, there won't be any more conversation. Who was it? Thomas Cahill wrote a book, said one thing you can't do in heaven is evangelize. Is that, is that who wrote that? I forget who. But the one thing you can't do in heaven is you can't evangelize. Right? Well, yeah, that's right, which means we ought to be doing that now. But what a good day that'll be when that job is over and everywhere we look around, there's people who know Christ and know the gospel and put their trust in his finished work and understand who they are in Christ and are, are, are in glory. That's going to be, as Paul says, the joy and crown of our ministry. Amen. You see, that's a good day. And so we sing because his returns will be glorious. It's when we get caught up to glory and the church sees its fruit. In mystery, Christ receives the church to glory. In prophecy, Christ returns to judge and make war. It should change the way we sing and what we sing about. So we use this opportunity talking about songs to deal with the content of those songs, okay? Um, look at 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. We believe in resurrection. We sing about the hope of glory we have. We sing about the coming of the Lord to receive the Lord, or to receive the church into glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, we know the glorious gospel of Christ. We know about the resurrection, the glory that it is. But you know what? We have this treasure of resurrection, of glory, in earthen vessels. In verse Four, it says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them, which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine to them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to come out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. While we're on earth, while our bodies are still you know, creaking and, and dying, while we still see the pains of this planet, while we still see the sufferings and the lack of this world, Paul says we have the 
excellency of the treasure of God's glory in us. This is the mystery, by the way, the mystery of how we can say, well, despite what you see around me and despite what you see of me, Jesus Christ saved me and his spirit dwells in me and I have all spiritual blessings. We have this treasure. We can sing the praises of God's glory now. You know how many Christians are not sure of their salvation? How many Christians do not understand God's will? How many people do not know why they are here, why bad things happen? And yet we have the answers to all of these things, according to the mystery of Christ. And we have this treasure, not waiting for it in eternity. Well, we'll ask the Lord when we get to heaven. You ever hold, heard your grandma say that, right? Your mom or somebody? Well, ask Jesus when you get to heaven about that, right? Why are pickles green? You know, why are butterflies orange? Ask God when you get to heaven about that. But the most important questions God has given us the answers to. And glory to God for that. We have that treasure now. We have the treasure now of singing as we do in other songs. We're complete in him. We're complete in Christ. Our salvation is done. It's a done deal. Imagine if we had to wait for eternity to happen to sing that. <laughs> no one would ever hear it. And we wouldn't be encouraged by it. Thank God he's given us the opportunity for that. Look at Colossians chapter 3 verse 2. Going back to our chapter here about when Paul mentions singing. And one reason why we sing is for the resurrected life now. We sing because of the hope of resurrection. We sing because Christ resurrected. We sing because of what's going to happen when he returns. We sing about that. And we sing because of the resurrected life now. Okay. God has saved you to change you. God has saved you by his grace, not of your works, to make you a servant of him so that you can know the resurrected life. And Colossians 3 is talking about that. That's why he says, if ye be risen with Christ, seek those things. He's talking about the resurrected life here. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on the things in the earth. Sometimes people read that in a religious way. Well, that means I shouldn't be concerned with my clothes. I shouldn't be concerned with the quality of the food that I eat. I shouldn't be concerned with the quality of the music that I sing. So we'll just chant. You know, that's what happened in the Roman Catholic Church for so many years. They just chant, right? But in Colossians chapter 3, it says, Set your affection on things above. The things on the earth are not those physical things like that. The things in heaven are not harps and clouds and angels. In fact, Colossians chapter 2, what Paul's responding to is people who are worrying about angels and clouds and piety. In Colossians chapter 2, down in verse uh, 20, he says, If you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, and you're resurrected with Christ. If you be dead with Christ, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? He's talking about the law. The earthly things are rules. The law, religiosity, is what he says. The things above are liberty, grace, peace, righteousness. Those are the heavenly things. And you can have those now because of the mystery of Christ. Whereas in every other religion, including Judaism, they were under bondage and could not proclaim liberty, could not proclaim peace, constantly trying to endure to the end, could not proclaim righteousness because they were trying to earn it, right? So Paul says, if you're dead with Christ and you're risen with the Lord, why in the world are you subjecting yourself to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. They're all to perish. It's, just, it's religion, is what Paul's saying. They're after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship. Oh, look at that guy in the front. He just fell down on the ground, praising God. Wow, that's pious. And we've seen the, the image that, we've, uh, that I've passed out to you all before about the different hand signals you're supposed to use in worship services and the piety that people associate with these things, the religiosity people have with confession, with coming down front, right, with being a part of the choir, thinking that somehow that brings them into a closer relationship with the Lord. When actually, don't you know that you're dead with Christ and you have all spiritual blessings and you have access to God's grace freely right now? Those things are earthly things. They're fleshly things. And people use singing for that in the church, I'm afraid. They use that as a fleshly activity. That's earthly. Singing in a church to glorify your flesh is earthly. Singing in the church to teach and admonish and to praise the Lord is heavenly. Same activity. You see what I'm getting at here? That's the difference. It's not that one is the things you touch and the other things are the things no one can touch. 
It's the knowledge, the doctrine that you have, and, and why you're doing it. It's the words that you're singing. When they turn down all the lights that are dark, and all the spotlights are on the drummer and the guitarist and the five singers, okay, who does that glorify? And can you read the Bible at all? It's too dark. You can't. So we're going to listen. Maybe we'll hold up our cell phones and have the lights, you know, Woodstock type of thing. But that's not glorifying to God in heavenly things. Isn't that kind of a fleshly thing, a worldly thing? You see how that is? He says, set your affections on things above. Do the singing for God's glory. Do the singing to teach. Do the singing to edify one another. Do the singing to rejoice in the Lord. Do the singing to live the resurrected life now. Not because you're trying to earn some favor, to plead with the Lord, to fill us with your spirit tonight. Right? Hello, Christ dwells, the Spirit dwells in you. We'll just X that song next. There's a reason why you sing. And there's a point to it. And you need to understand right doctrine. Set your affection on things above, not on the things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ, is what Paul says. Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, shall appear. Sometimes I think when Paul says, you know, if Christ be not resurrected, and there are of all men most miserable, just is not true for some people. <laughs> just not true. In fact, you know, if they didn't have to do all those things for the Lord, their life may be a little, little more comfortable and a little better. Is it true that you live a miserable life if it were Christ didn't resurrect? It says here, Christ is your life. If it's your life, that means you're hoping for it, you're looking for it, you're desiring it, you see the value in that, right? It's not your life, and yeah, he can come tomorrow, he can come next week. Take your time, Lord. I'm having a good time. You see the difference? And so to live the resurrected life is why we sing songs about sound doctrine, about our behavior, about who we are in Christ, to remind us of what's important, to encourage and motivate us to act upon what God has taught us. And so we sing these songs. because We know it's true. We know it's right. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Not every day it sounds so sweet. <laughs> so you sing the song to remind you, right, of how sweet the sound is. You sing the song, when the Lord appears in glory, I'll be there, and that's going to be a good day, okay? And so we sing songs for that purpose, to live that resurrected life. God wants us to understand sound doctrine. Look at Colossians chapter 1. God wants us to understand sound doctrine so that we can experience the joy that is being in Christ Jesus. Say, what's the point of learning all this doctrine, Okay. Why can't we just skip this and do some singing? Because I really feel good when I do that singing. Well, that's the point of music, isn't it? To lift up the spirit, okay, the soul of people. That's why churches, that's all they do now is the music, to try to, to get a response from our flesh. But Colossians 1, Paul says this is where it starts. If you want to experience true, everlasting, rejoicing, and joy with the Lord, you start with understanding the Lord, knowing his will. So in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul prays that, you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He prays they would go to school. You see that? I pray you would know God's will, that you'd have knowledge and understanding and wisdom. But what's the point of all that knowledge? Verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord, so that you would not make a mess by the way you do things, because you know the right way and the wrong way to do them, the right song to sing and the wrong song to sing in church. You know the right thing to hope for and the wrong kingdom to build. You know how you can discern. So that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and continuing to increase the knowledge of God. Okay, so we got some understanding. Now we're making decisions and discerning using that doctrine. We're able to walk a certain way now. We're doing it correctly. We're not going the wrong direction. Verse 11, it says, Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. You see, God's goal for the church, which is to teach and edify so that we would walk worthy, is so that we can patiently wait and endure and suffer long with joy. With joy. Joy in the Lord. That's the reason. The reason why we sing in the church, because the goal of God for us in the church is that we would operate today according to his will in joy. Right? Because we've got a long wait. People say, well, I don't think so. Look at the signs. We had a blood moon on Tuesday. Christ is coming back next week, packing my bags, right? Well, what if he doesn't, right? We don't have a verse telling us that. 
And so we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting for this hope of glory and the resurrection. And so that we can do it with joyfulness, and not the kind of joy and simple pleasures the world brings, but eternal joyfulness, we know right doctrine and can apply it to our lives. We walk a certain direction, and we know why, and we know whom we believed, and that he is able to keep that which we've committed to him against that day. Another hymn in our hymnal. You see there, the result is joy. So we sing to live the resurrected life, to experience the joy. That's why we sing. That's why the songs need to have right doctrine in them. The verse that we're going to sing today in our song says, When life brings sorrow with it, know who Christ will bring with him. Well, who will Christ bring with him? All the saints and believers before you in the church who did the same thing as you, lived their life praising God and giving glory to him. Right? That's who's going to bring with them. And suddenly, you'll be in the majority. How would that feel? <laughs> right? That'll be the day. When life brings sorrow with it, remember who Christ will bring with him. When this life gets worse, remember the hope of glory you have. So we sing the doctrine. And we sing the chorus. When the Lord appears in glory, I'll be there, you'll be there, we'll be there. It'll be a good day. And we sing that song to bring us joy in the knowledge of right doctrine, the knowledge of God's word. Fourthly and lastly, we sing for grace and peace in the church. Why do we sing? It's for grace and peace. Okay, notice this was not the first reason I put on the outline there. If we're just using music to keep the peace, we're doing it wrong. But Colossians 3.16, notice what Paul says. He says in Colossians 3, uh, down 15 rather, he says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. That one body is the mystery church, the one body. And it says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So God has called us to peace. There's one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We have unity in the church, and that unity is around the truth. That unity is around Jesus Christ. And so we sing accordingly. In Colossians 3.16, it says, We're to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. We have grace doctrine in our hearts, and we sing it to each other. We sing it to the Lord, is what it says there. Is that to the Lord? And I have a, an imagination that thinks that just as God changed the sound of the voice of Peter to speak Roman and to speak Croatian or whoever they were from, God hears our singing, changing our sour notes into something heavenly. That would be nice to think about, that type of tongue transition. But Colossians chapter 3, it says we're singing to the Lord, Colossians 3 verse 16. Okay? The verse in the song we're going to sing says in, the, in verse 4, Let us labor for the Master. From the dawn till setting sun. We have work to do. You see, though we're looking for the resurrection, we're hoping for his return, we know how glorious it's going to be, we're here right now, and we have work to be, to be done. And so we sing for grace and peace in the church. We sing for the growth of the church. There's one song we didn't get to in our series I'd really love to sing. It's going to be in our hymnal before the seminar. It talks about Jesus Christ being why we get together. It talks about the church and how we're not spectators. We're trying to be participants in the church. And this is the song that is singing. Imagine singing that at a church, that we're not spectators, we're not bringing our selfishness here, but we're working together and coordinating together and cooperating together. That's, that, that's the verse of the song. It's an amazing hymn uh, wit, uh, uh, written by a guy named Watch, uh, wit, Witness, Lee, Witness Lee, but uh, we'll be putting that in the hymnal shortly. The point I'm trying to make here is that we sing for one purpose, to bring grace and peace to the church. Okay? Grace in our hearts is what's required. When we sing with right doctrine, the singing ceases to be fleshly activity. It's no longer a performance. Now we're singing because it's right. We're singing because it brings peace in the church. The doctrine comforts one another, 1 Thessalonians 4 says, and it's sound. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Whatsoever you do, you're going to sing, sing it, giving thanks to the Lord, is what it says in Colossians 3.17 in the church. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul talks about eating. Whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink, do it all for the glory of God. You see, your direction changes, your perspective changes when you know right doctrine. And so when we sing songs in the church and we say that God tells us to sing and Paul instructs us to sing, that's not a justification for any old fleshly way you want to do it. It's an explanation of why God created these things for us to enjoy. It's an explanation of why we should sing and why and how it can bring us joy. Okay, so this is, this is why we sing. Um, I want to sing the song, When the Lord Appears in Glory, which I think is number 45 in your hymnal. 44.
44. It's to the tune of when the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather to be ever with the Lord, and the Lord appears in glory, I'll be there. When the Lord appears in glory, 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 I'll be there. In a moment on that final day, the dead in Christ shall rise, and the rest are changed immortal in the air. When the risen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the Lord appears in glory, I'll be there. When the Lord appears in glory, 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 I'll be there. When this life brings sorrow with it, know who Christ will bring with him, and the glory of his resurrection share. Speak comfort to each other till we sing and stand with them. When the Lord appears in glory, I'll be there. When the Lord appears in glory, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the Master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all His wondrous love and care. Then when all this life is over and our work on earth is done And the Lord appears in glory, I'll be there When the Lord appears in glory When the Lord appears in glory When the Lord appears in glory When the Lord appears in glory, I'll be there Lord, we thank you for giving us all things freely to enjoy and we Thank you for giving us the ability to sing. Thank you for giving us a reason to sing and things to sing about. And I thank you for the folks here that I can sing with, that we can glory in what you promised us, that you will appear and receive us up to heavenly glory. And so we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for resurrection. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks.